that uh, distinguished American folklorist uh, Linwood Montel. Uh, I'm Bert Feintuck from the University of New Hampshire. I had the pleasure of working with Linwood for 13 years, from 1975 to 1988 at, at Western. Uh, and Doug Boyd from the University of Kentucky, a great uh, follower of Linwood's work. Uh, and I have the uh, privilege of, of spending some time conversing with Lynn. And toward the end, the plan is to open it up for the questions you've been dying to ask him as well. Um, I gather we're being videotaped, although for what, I don't know. <laughs> Homeland Security. Okay, Homeland Security. <laughs> uh, can we want this to be as comfortable and casual as possible? And I think, Doug, you wanted to start off? Sure, I, I think uh, one of the things that we'd like to do is to take the opportunity to sort of um, uh, go back a bit and, and, and actually talk about your, uh, so, since so much of your, your academic work is centered upon this region, um, and Kentucky, uh, talk a little bit about growing up in the region that you you have uh, studied so much and, and, and taught us so much about. So uh, so thought we'd sort of start off by having you talk a little bit about growing up in uh, Monroe County. So you do know that I'm a native of Monroe County, yes, and I'm impressed. <laughs> I did grow up in Monroe County, but I'm not a city boy. I'm a very much a country boy, and. Uh, I'm so thankful for my memories that I have of what life was like growing up. And if I had to take a million dollars, and I'm very serious, I've been purged my mind of my childhood memories, and I would not take a million dollars for it. And, uh, but I, I, I did grow up on a farm, and uh, it was back during, during the times when I was a little fella. I mean, times were hard back then. We did have shoes in the wintertime, but we did not have anything to wear in the line of shoes in the summertime. And I see a head shaking back there, yes, that means you also are familiar with that. But uh, it, it's, it was simply back at a time before a radio, we got our first radio when I was eight years old, and it was a battery powered radio. And I'll never forget when they were listening or we were listening to the Grand Ole Opry on Saturday nights. I would get down on my knees and go crawling across the floor to that radio and look up in behind it, <laughs> wondering who that was that was making that music and singing. I really thought it was coming out of that box, you know, if somebody was back there. And just things like that is what I remember so vividly about my growing up years. And, uh, it's just precious to me, and when I do die at age 130, I'm not 130 tonight, now, <laughs> 130 years old, then uh, I'm going to be taken home to Monroe County and be buried in the same cemetery where portions of six generations of my people are buried. And I treasure that very, very much. It started back in 1798. And my brother, and he passed away three months ago, but he and I and our sister, we still own a portion of the original family home place taken up in 1790s or something as a revolutionary uh, veteran, a, a land grant given to a, a great, 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 go on back to the greats, the grandfather. We still own a portion of that land that, that he received for being a revolutionary veteran. Tell us something about your parents and your family. Well, my mom, well, let me tell you this. My dad, he was Willie Montel, and uh, he was working in uh, Toledo, Ohio, when the Great Depression hit in uh, 1929. And he worked at the Chief Willis Overland factory and he lost his job when the Great Depression hit and rather than stay up there and try to find a job that would keep him going he decided to come home to Monroe County Kentucky and make a living farming and thank God he did this because he met my mom and they got married and so here I am right now and uh, my mother was uh, Hazel Chapman, and she was a, a descendant of the Scrolls, and I didn't mention that name a minute ago, but they're the ones, that he's the one who received the land grant, S-T-R-O-D-E. 
And uh, so that's, that's the, well, you know, she, she was the chaplain, but she was descended from the Strohs, as well as the chaplains. And my dad was descended from, uh, well, I'm going to be honest with you, we're not quite sure who my, my dad's father was. But he was such a wonderful, wonderful man. And that does not matter with me one little bit. But you, you spent so much time uh, in your life teaching. And I was going to get you to talk about some of your early school experiences and some of your early teachers. Okay. I went to a wandering school all of my elementary years. And I'm in the process now of writing my own life history. And I've got 58 pages on the computer about my one room school years, and I'm not out of the eighth grade yet. <laughs> <laughs> and that, now let me tell you one of my, because the thing about it is, and I'm speaking to all of you now, when you write down some memory of something that took place back then, that reminds you of something else that took place. And as you write that one down, that reminds you of something else, and it just keeps going and going and going. But here's one of my favorite stories, and it's a true story. Of course, we had outhouses back then at the school, and uh, I, I went out to the outhouse one, mor one morning, and I came back in, and I sat down, and the teacher, who was Jerry Bowman, he said, Linwood, come up here. <laughs> And I got up and walked up there, and he said, button your britches, you forgot to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and could I tell you also about my first sweetheart ever? Absolutely. Okay, now her name was Nellie Gray, and I was eight years old, and Nellie Gray was nine years old. And I was crazy about Nellie Gray, and here's why. She could work up a mouthful of spit. <laughs> Real ooey gooey thin stuff and then she'd go and let it go down all the way to her knees and she'd go and suck it back up. <laughs> well somebody would yell, Nelly, Nelly, do that again, yeah. Nelly. And she would. And suck it back up. Well if I could have found a preacher who would have married an eight year old boy and a nine year old girl, I would have married my darling Nelly Gray. But at the end of that school year, she and her brothers and sisters and mother and father, they all moved north to Terre Haute, Indiana, where he uh, was looking for a job, and they moved up there, and I ain't never seen my darling Nellie Gray since then. <laughs> <laughs> but there are so many stories like that that, that, that all of you can think of. And, but as far as the one-room school was concerned, and I am working presently, on a, a book of stories told by former one-room school teachers. And I have interviewed a 100-year-old lady and a one who's a 101 years old. And the 100-year-old lady, when I talked with her, her mind was so good and so sharp, she would laugh and giggle and tell stories. It's amazing the types of things that she could share with me. And, I, and, and I, it's, it's so vividly important and impressive to hear their accounts because you, you learn what their life was like as a school teacher and what the kids were like. And, and I, all I can say is that back then, if you got a spanking at school and your parents found out about it even a day or so later, you got a spanking when you got home. And now then what happens? the parents will either sue the principal or the teacher when, when a kid gets a spanking. And that's just one of the things that has changed across the year. Because back then, going to a one-room school, I treasure this because as a little one, you could listen to the older ones do their recitations there. And as an older, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, and when the second, third, and fourth graders were doing their recitations in school, it was a constant review process. It really was. And by golly, I, I, I truly think that we learned as much, or maybe even more back then, as some of the young people do today. So I'll, I just treasure my memories of a one-room school year, a one-room school period. What was it like making the transition from a one-room school to a larger class? Uh, 
environments and a larger school environment as you grew? Well, of course, I went from the one room school to uh, a high to high school, and I, before I get into that, let me say this: uh, well, one of the boys, when we got out of the eighth grade, he moved north to Indianapolis, or actually Naptown, Indiana. Mm -hmm as it was called back then, and he got a job for a dollar and 25 cents an hour. And I thought, my gosh, why in the world am I going to high school? Why don't I go up there, up north, and get me a get job rich. and get, get, get rich the same way? Because back then, I could go to Tompkinsville on Saturdays. When I was seven, eight, nine, ten years old, I could go to Teenville on Saturdays and I could buy two Dubby hamburgers, <laughs> a Coca-Cola, and go to the movie for a grand total of 26 cents. Hamburgers were a nickel apiece, drinks were a nickel apiece, but it cost 11 cents to go to the movie. <laughs> that doggone <laughs> penny tax. <laughs> and I may not have answered the, uh, like you wanted me to. But, <laughs> but could you say something about Tompkinsville in those yeah. days and, and about, you know, your sort of just everyday life living outside of Tompkinsville. Well, Tompkinsville was just Tompkinsville as far as I was concerned. Has it changed much? <laughs> it really has not changed all that much except there are now about to build a bypass around Tompkinsville. And what does that, what's that going to do? It kills all of the downtown stores and businesses. It, it truly does. And they're about to do this. But Tompkinsville was simply a, a, a prized place for me to go to when I was a little boy. And uh, it, it's still basically the same now as it was back then, but it's, it, it's a, lot, a lot of different things have taken place also. And how, far, how far were you from Tompkinsville and your family's place? Six miles north of Tompkinsville. And how would you get to Tompkinsville? Ooh. <laughs> okay, now here's the first part of the story, <laughs> and that is we lived a mile and a half off of the main road. Now the main road was not a paved road, the main road was a gravel road, but the road we lived on was a dirt road. And back then, when it rained, and you tried to drive into Tompkinsville uh, uh, with a car, you know, on a dirt road, you always got stuck in a mud hole somewhere in that one and a half miles out to the main road. And I'll never forget, my brother and I and our mother, we would get it when my dad got stuck in a mud hole, we would get out and go over and grab a fence rail. And all three of us would pry that car out of that mud hole and finally get it out, and we can go on into Tompkinsville then. And as I've said many, many times, back then, I just could not wait until my parents were able to buy a Dodge car, because I thought a Dodge car was made to Dodge mud holes. <laughs> and I really did. And I was telling us that's the same thing over at Burksville several years ago when I was doing a presentation. And when I told that about the Dodge car, dodging mud holes, a man stood up and he said, you won't believe this. But when I was a little boy, I believed the same thing you did about Dodge cars. And I also believed that that Ford cars were made to Ford <laughs> 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 Well, you know. But, but it's simply the country life, though, I mean, it, it was totally different back then than it is now because we did not have a tractor. The first tractor in our whole community was uh, purchased in 1945 by the agricultural, the, the county agricultural agent. And everybody in our home community laughed at him. They said that crazy fool, he'll turn that tractor over on a hillside up here and kill his fool self. And it wasn't over a year after that though, until every family had bought a tractor. Mm -hmm. did, did, was there much local music in your childhood? Every Saturday night or every Sunday afternoon, there's somebody, we, we got together at one of the homes in the community and people would, would gather in for three, four, or five miles around 
just to listen to the people making music or even telling stories. And back then they would tell the, uh, those old Hank tales. Do you know that word Hank? Mm -hmm. That's not, it's not a haunt, it's a Hank. <laughs> but they would tell those old Hank tales until the kids would just be scared to death and would go run over and hop into bed, you know, if it were at nighttime. And sometimes we didn't get out of the bed like we should have to, to go use what was called a bathroom, but it wasn't a bathroom then, it was the outhouse. But you know what we did in the bed, of course. That, that did happen on several occasions. <laughs> I'm not, I didn't answer your question like you asked. But. Well, can you talk more about what the music was like and also what about church music? Okay, uh, what the music was like, it was truly old time ballads for the most part, the most part. People would sing those old ballads, and you know what a ballad is, of course. It's simply a, it's a story told in song. And they would, they would sing those old songs, and many people would sit around and cry while they were listening to that song being sung. And uh, I forget now what else I was going to say, but, uh, but in terms of music, they, they also, uh, many people you know, played the guitar and the, and the fiddle and, and things of that sort. But, and not the banjo, but the banjo. But the, ba the banjo was my favorite instrument back then. I just wish that I could have learned to play it. <coughs> but I never was able to learn how. I'm not a musician whatsoever. But th they, they did. They, they sang those old songs, and it was just so touching. And I still love to hear the same old songs. I'll never forget my great aunt on my father's side of the family had moved to Chicago, Illinois. And uh, when she was a little girl, she and she was bored without legs from the knees down. And she would sit on her two brothers' laps and would, would sing while they would play you know, guitar or fiddle or whatever. And she would sing those old ballads. And, uh, but, and I'd been told that she had written down virtually all of those old ballads that she used to sing. And so I wrote her back in the late 60s when she was still alive, and I asked her, could you please send me some of those little ballads that you used to sing? <coughs> Excuse me. And she sent me 35 ballads that she had written down that she used to sing when she was a little girl. And then in terms of church music, I've just got to tell you a story about this. The stingiest man that God ever created. <laughs> I'll even call his name. His name is Hezzy Walder. And he was so articulate. And as a song leader, he would say, now let's sing number 137. And of course they would lead out and they would and they would sing it, you know, and get through. And then he would say, let's sing number 244 now. And then when it finally came time to take up the offering, or to pass the plate, as it was called back then, pass the offering plate, he would always develop a cough. <laughs> <laughs> he was the stingiest man that God ever created. And he would get this cough. <coughs> and he would go out the back door of the church, and you could hear him while we were in there singing and taking up the offering. He would be out there coughing and spitting. You can hear <laughs> and it spit like that. And as soon as they got through taking up the offering, he would walk back inside the church and say, now let's say number 421. <laughs> but the, the old songs that they were saying back then, and, and I still remember a lot of them, of course, but uh, because they were in a book. But my, my dad was a song leader, and his favorite song was when all of God's singers get home. And I love that song. And he's gone now, he's been gone quite a while. Well, when I went to high school, I went three years to Gamaliel High School, that's spelled G-A-M-A-L-I-L, -E and we lived six miles north of Tompkinsville, but Gamalia was located eight miles south of Tompkinsville on the other side over there. And we had to pay $3 a month to ride the bus. 
It was not a county owned bus, it was a privately owned bus. And why we went through Tompkinsville and went eight more miles, I was never able to figure it out. The people who lived even five and six miles north of us would ride that same bus. They lived in some place called Cyclone or even a place called Persimmon. There really was a Persimmon there. And so they, anyway, we all drove down to Gamalia and I went there for three years. My brother was such a good basketball player back then that he decided that he wanted to move to that is to, to play basketball at Tompkinsville. And so, by golly, my parents decided, yes, we'll move to Tompkinsville so Charles can play basketball out there. And so we did. We, we moved with about a mile and a half out of Tompkinsville and went to school there, and he was a fantastically good player. He was offered about four different uh, college scholarships, but he turned it all down and joined the U.S. Navy. And but he did play basketball in the Navy, by the, by the way. But I've got to tell you a story about when I went to Gamalia. There was a high school also at Fountain Run in Monroe County. And every time we the Fountain Run would play anybody in basketball, their cheerleaders would get out on the court at halftime. And they would give this same yell against whoever they were playing. They would say, for example, Fountain Run, Fountain Run, what a team! Gamalia, Gamalia, what a team? <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was giving a talk about seven years ago at Fountain Run, and I was laughing about those cheerleaders giving that yell, and two ladies stood up. <laughs> They said, you won't believe this, but we were two of those cheerleaders. <laughs> <laughs> and then anyway, after I got out of high school from Tompkinsville, then I went to Nashville, Tennessee, and to a business university. Ooh. I went to Andrew Jackson Business University in Nashville, Tennessee. And you never heard of that, I don't guess. It closed down in, in the late 50s or early 60s, and Belmont University, purchased the property that, that, uh, that Andrew Jackson was on. And when I got out of that, from out, out of school, I moved to Bowling Green where I got a job making $150 a month. Ooh! <laughs> but I worked for a, a year for $150 a month. And I finally decided I'm not making enough money to get by on. So, I think what I'll do is try to find me another job. And somebody tried to recruit me in the Navy, and I says, well, what will I make if I join the U.S. Navy? And they said, $190 a month. I said, I'll take it. <laughs> and that, that's, that's a true story. And I went through boot camp in San Diego, California in 1951. And uh, in the December, the first week of December, it snowed an inch of snow in San Diego, California. That was unheard of. And there were 101 of us in my boot company in San Diego, California. 100 of them were sent to Guam for further reassignment aboard, aboard a vessel. One was sent to Norman, Oklahoma, <laughs> in the U.S. Navy, in Norman, Oklahoma. <laughs> Not a lot to do, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it was the Naval Air Technical Training Center, and I was, I was a pay clerk there. And by golly, it was amazing how we would talk to each other, the sailors, and we would say, we're not in the U.S. Navy, we're in the Canadian River Navy. Well, the Canadian River flowed right through northern <laughs> Oklahoma, and it got so low in the summertime when the sun would, you know, when it got to be dry, that by golly, you could literally step across that river there in northern Oklahoma. And then from there, I requested, uh, I had, after 21 months, I had to tell what I wanted for my, the rest of my tour of duty, my four years. And I said, well, I want an oiler, a tanker, and a refrigerator ship in that order, whichever one you want to give me. Well, seven months later, my, all of my orders finally came in to be transferred from Norman, Oklahoma to San Juan, Puerto Rico. 
And my chief petty officer there in Oklahoma, he was so mad at me, he, he cursed me for every word that you can imagine, bad words. And he said, not until you blank, they blank, 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 blank. I have tried for six years to be transferred to San Juan, Puerto Rico. Who in the H do you know <laughs> in Washington, D.C. that would send you down to San Juan, Puerto Rico? And I got, I got to wondering, well, why did I get sent to Norman, Oklahoma, and why did I get transferred then to Puerto Rico? So it must be that somebody in Washington didn't know me. I don't know, but maybe they do. <laughs> and it might have been Peggy Bulger. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, she started the first dossier. <laughs> Were you an officer? No, oh. I was simply a, a and I didn't, I, I was a dispersing clerk, second class petty officer. <laughs> But I did not take my, my test to become a first class petty officer because I knew I was going to get out of the Navy when my four years expired. And I knew I would pass the exam most likely, so I didn't want to knock somebody else out. And I didn't take the test. So now let's get into something serious now. <laughs> how, long, how long were you in San Juan? Uh, the rest of my tour of duty. Yeah. So it seemed uh, from 31 until 40, 13 months. And I didn't even get to, I've got to tell this story too. I didn't even get to go on a, on a U.S. Navy ship my whole 14, I mean my whole four years in the Navy. I, I was sent from uh, Norman, Oklahoma up to Brooklyn, New York to get aboard a vessel to go down to San Juan, Puerto Rico. And I, it was an Army transport vessel. And I got on there and I was the only sailor on it. And they issued vomit bags the second day out onto the ocean because it was sort of doing like this, and, and we all got sick. But they did not issue me a vomit bag, and I begged for one. They, they said, "You don't need one. You're a swabby." That was a, a term for a, a person in the navy. You don't need one, and they would never give me a vomit bag. So one day. I was still sick in the stomach, and I went into the, uh, maybe I shouldn't tell this, <laughs> because that rascal may find out about it, but I, I went into the assistant commanding officer's office of, aboard this vessel, and he wasn't in there, thank goodness, and so I stuck my finger in my mouth and made myself vomit right on his floor. And I, and I never told anybody what I had done. <laughs> All right, so so let's 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 make the turn now. <laughs> On that note. Oh, you got a vomit. <laughs> so uh, talk about the transition now. You know, between you know, you were in the Navy and um, and found yourself, you know, you know, from from the Navy to folklore. Take us take us to uh, to folklore school and, and how you, you. Okay, that's very easy to do. Okay, uh, when I got out of the Navy, I went to Campbellsville, it's now a university a college back then, for two years, and then I transferred to the University of Kentucky, and I was going to make a veterinarian. And by golly, the more I took chemistry courses and math courses, the more I knew I was in the wrong field. And so the reason I got turned around completely was this chemistry professor that I was taking this the class under, he would stand at the, facing the, uh, the board with his back to the class. And he would lecture to us, never facing us. And he would lecture, and he would write what he was saying with his right hand, and he would, as he, as he was writing, he would erase with his left hand. And you could never have the full time to write down what all he had said. And I'll never forget, I, after about halfway into that semester, I prayed. I said, Lord, if you'll get me out of this course with at least a B minus, a C minus average, then I'll get into a field that I like. Well, I got out of that course, and I don't know how, why, but I guess the Lord took care of me because I got a B out of that doggone course. But I transferred to Western then because my wife was working at Kentucky Utilities, and we had to, we had to move down there. So I transferred to Western, and I took a, a course in folklore under D.K. Wilkes. Ever heard, ever heard that name? Oh, yeah. Sure. 
And when I took that course under him, I mean, I fell in love. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a folklorist. And he was impressed with me enough because I was impressed with him. He literally contacted Indiana University and said, I would like to recommend Linwood Montel for a scholarship for, his, for a doctoral program. And by golly, I got it. Talk about the class. Talk about Vilgus and, and the class. Well, it's just simply, he, he, was, a, he was a good singer. And it, it, he would sing there, uh, the, the old ballads especially, and things of that sort. And then he would tell stories. And it was just fantastic what kind of a teacher he was. And, and maybe I tried to become the one just like him, but I'm sure I never did. But, <laughs> but it, he, he was just so good. It, it inspired me to do what I knew that I would really like to do. And so I did go to Indiana University and got my master's degree and PhD there. And I even got there, he was not teaching then, but Stith Thompson. Have you ever heard of Stith Thompson? Oh, yeah. Now, <laughs> how many of you know where Stith Thompson was from originally? I do. Where? Well, he was from Kentucky. Yes. And I'm trying, I think it was kind of over in your area, maybe. Well, it was from uh, Washington County, but not Springfield, Willisburg. <laughs> And I love to drive through Willisburg even this day and time because I think about Stith Thompson. And for those of you who don't know him, he became internationally famous as a folklorist who simply could uh, identify every traditional story that was told by using motifs and by, by also by indicating in what other country in a, around the world where it was this story had it been told. And he inspired me very, very much. But what in, who, the person who really inspired me there at, uh, at Indiana University, of course, Richard Dawson and, 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 and uh, Dr. Roberts, uh, Warren Roberts, and all the others like that. But my senior year, my last year, that is, as a PhD candidate, they, the, the university employed Dr. Carl Ortwin or Big Sauer, S-A-U-E-R, who was a cultural geographer. And he had retired from UCLA. They, they employed him to come in and teach geography there at IU. I took a course under him, and I fell in love with cultural geography also. But especially, he made this statement at least, I'd say, a half a dozen times. And he was getting along in his 70s then. He said, if I had my academic years to live over, I would choose for myself one small sub-regional area. And I would go there and, and look at the cultural landscape. And then I would go back and, uh, every 15 years and look at the changes that had taken place. Well, that inspired me to choose for myself the Kentucky, Tennessee, Upper Cumberland area, but I did not wait every 15 years to go back because I still go back three, four, or five times a year and drive every side road in a 19-county sub-regional area in Kentucky and Tennessee. And the books that I've written, <coughs> basically all of my books, have focused all in that region. And as I tell people, and I, I'm, I'm preaching to you now, and, and you need to use the same commentary. Because historians used to laugh at me for being a folklorist and, and relying on oral history for the books that I wrote. And as I t tell people, folklore is not the falsehood of history. Folklore is the history of the 99.99% of the world's population whose names never get into history books. <coughs> Could you understand me? Yeah. Somebody talk while I clear my throat here sure. a little bit. <laughs> sure. well, that, that was a, a line that uh, Warren, we heard that from Warren Roberts all the time. He was passionate about that. that uh, so anybody here? Uh, I don't know if anyone here confirmed this. He, he, was a, he was a wonderful Fed professor. Yeah, yeah that was. I wanted to ask you about early field work, and, and I'm thinking particularly that uh, I know there's some marvelous uh, recordings of traditional music in the archive of Western 
that say they were recorded by D.K. Wilkes, you, and in some occasions Archie Green, Ed Kahn, yes. and others. And I've, I've, I've <coughs> wondered about your relationship to D.K. and when those things were happening in terms of your own development. Were you his student, taking him to, to musicians you knew, people like Jim Bowles, for instance? Well, actually, I did that. Mm -hmm. and indeed, I did take D.K. Wilkes with me around uh, several places, especially a, a person named Jim Bowles. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, and he was a wonderful, wonderful backcountry fiddler. I mean, he, he was a fantastic. But we went to other, uh, other musicians as well, as singers, as well as just simply people who played an instrument, you know. And uh, we recorded many, many, many of, of those people. And it's, it's amazing how important now those archives are because people back then just weren't doing that sort of thing for the most part. And now then, a, a lot of even the history professors not, not doing that same sort of thing, but they're doing something similar to that when they used to laugh at them. But the, what we all need to do is to do it ourselves or to, to, in court, to uh, involve students asking them to go do certain uh, overall traditional history projects, such as singing, music making, storytelling, even stories passed along within the family, because if, if you don't record these stories told in, in your family or in their family, then they lose so much of their cultural heritage when that family member is gone. And it is truly important that we do all of this and so folklore, it truly is, as they say, Warren Roberts would say, <coughs> folklore is, is not the falsehood of history. It is a history of all of those people whose names never get into history books. And so how and, did, and did, did I say this, uh, did I tell you this, and I tell people as they go around the state, I could care less writing about kings and queens and presidents. I write about local life and local people. So, so take us to, to Coe Ridge from there. Ooh. Yeah. How many of you ever heard of the saga of Coe Ridge? Well, wow. let me stand up and honor you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to tell you a story about that to begin with. First of all, for those of you who don't know, it's about a black community that used to be in southern Cumberland County, Kentucky, called Zeke Town or Coe Ridge. And I'll never forget when I started doing research for that with my doctoral dissertation on, on the, the history of that community. I was told that by all means, what you do need to do is go talk with a, a Mrs. Anders, A-N-D-E-R-S, because she can tell you so much of her people's history, history that, that will be gone forever if you don't record it from her. So I went to her. And I told, I said, Ms. Anders, I'm working on my doctor's degree at Indiana University and I need to talk to you about your people because I've been told you know so much about your people's history. She said, you're working on a doctor's degree? I said, yes I am. She says, now are you going to be the kind that does people some good or just one of them teacher fellers? <laughs> <laughs> she, she literally knew the difference in, in doctors and she lived back in the boonies. <laughs> But anyway, uh, that, that book uh, was my doctoral dissertation at Indiana University. And uh, Dick Dorson, Richard Dorson, thought that what it, it does, it did need to be published. And so I contacted the University of Tennessee Press. And they decided to publish that book. And it came out in 1970. And in 1971, I was given the Award of Merit by the American Association for State and Local History for doing such a, a good, memorable job as I did with that book. Because it was the first book ever written about a, a rural black community in the whole United States. And I'm bragging now, I mean, I'm still, I'm already bragging, <laughs> but portions of that book, because it focused on oral traditional history, and the people in Germany were, were doing the same sort of thing, starting to. And because of the, it focused on oral traditional history, portions of that book were translated into German and published in Germany. And the saga of Coleridge 
is sold or was sold in bookstores in both Germany and England. So that's one of my most precious books that I've written and I truly, truly do appreciate being able to write that because it did indeed create history. Well, because of that, I'm going to have you expand on the writing and the fieldwork of that process, but first I have to, since you jumped ahead to publishing, I have to ask the question that I've always wanted to ask you. <laughs> Why is it shaped the way it is? The book. It's like this it's one. Than that. <laughs> it's it sticks than out that. from all the other books on my shelf. As the, <laughs> as the old fellow would have said, that was a precious business. <laughs> but but the, the thing that uh, they did, though, instead of putting footnotes at the bottom of the yeah. page or over at the end of the book, they said, what let's do, since the, those notes are so valuable and so important, let's put them over to the side, just opposite, where, where you know the footnote uh, indication is made. And so that's the reason why I did the, the book was expanded lengthwise, because of, of the putting the footnotes where they did. It's a great idea, and it works when you read it. It's, uh, but it sticks out <coughs> too now, so you know that's... And th that book, uh, I don't know where it's used now, but at least it was used in several colleges around the nation as required reading for their students, uh, to, to, to teach them how they u utilize oral history and how valuable it was. I'm using it next semester. Are you really? And those footnotes, I mean, it forces them. you to read the footnotes. It does. It now, does. a lot of people don't, you know, it's a hassle to have to go to the back of them, text, yeah, that's and right. this way you, you don't miss it. So you're using the saga of Coleridge? As I have Ooh. just about every year. <laughs> Thank you, that's wonderful. Go back a little bit, though, and talk about this idea of, of formulating in your mind the relationship between history and folklore and working with Dorson on that. And how, you know, what, what role did Dorson have in in your dissertation? Well, I don't know that I can truly answer that right off, mm -hmm. but I, I do know this, that Dorson at one time, uh, mm -hmm. when he had written a book about some uh, community or uh, area up in southwestern Michigan, and, uh, and because of, of that book, he said because it focused on, on local life and people up there, and he said that's the sort of thing that, that all of his students should do, you know, uh, it, it, it is to work like that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Richard Dawson was truly an inspiration to me also. And uh, what else did you ask me now? I've got a senior moment here. That, well, that, that book would be uh, Bloodstoppers and Bear Wars. Uh -huh. Yes, that, that, that is it, yes indeed. Did, did you have a sense when you were doing that work for, for Coleridge that, is, that, that you're doing something different, something new? Yes, and I, I truly did feel that, that, that I was doing something new, that something that did need to be done, because as, as I said before, back then, historians laughed at me. It's amazing how they ridiculed what I was doing, and yet I knew that if, if a history like that of, of, of these of small rural communities if it were not done by the oral traditional uh, historical method, it could never be written. And uh, so I, I just kept on doing what I was doing, and I have never stopped. I, I'm still working and using that same sort of uh, technology. And uh, one of the uh, books that I wrote was called Killings, Folk Justice in the Upper South. And uh, now that, that is their term. It's, it, was their, it was a killing, not a homicide or a murder. And so anyway, the, these killings took place in defense of personal property. You slept with my wife, bang. You stole my hog, <laughs> they cut their throat and kill them. And whenever a killing occurred, the local people did not call the local sheriff. They simply formed a community inquest committee to go to the scene of the killing to determine not the question of guilt or innocence, but the question of motive. Was it a proper motive to kill that person? If so, they were forgiven on the spot. And if they were church goers, they were back in church on Sunday morning. And many, many people whom I interviewed for that book, when I would get through them with them telling me the stories about these killings that occurred, they would say, now Montel, you better change the names of the people and places when you write that book. If you don't, you might get shot and killed yourself. 
<laughs> well, I did change the names of the people and places, but not because I was afraid I'd get shot and killed, but I didn't want to embarrass the descendants from the people who were involved in all of the killings and what have you. So what I do now, when I sell a copy of the killings book, I will, will give you a free copy of a, a three-page listing of the pseudonyms <laughs> of, of, and the real names. And the people then later on who told me that I should change the names of the people and places, they asked me, why did you listen to me? Why didn't you leave the names like there were? <laughs> so as you write books like this, and many of you have done this, I'm sure, but as you write books that, that focus on, on local life and local people, you run into some weird situations, but some very interesting situations that do need to be described. I have a little memory of this actually, about 1975 or 1976. I'm sure you don't remember this no, story. No, I'm six years old there. Yeah, but <laughs> when I had just started at Western, I, I rode down to Tompkinsville with you. I, I think you were just showing me around. And um, and I remember, the two, I remember that we parked the car, I think it was Tompkinsville, and I had a camera with me, and I said, as we're getting out of the car, I said, should, I, should we lock the car with my sort of urban sensibility? And, and you said, said no, nobody's going to steal a camera out of your car. And then you went on to say, they'll shoot you down in the street, but nobody's going to steal a camera. And, and, and you said, I you said that, that there was somebody, I think in local law enforcement, who had threatened you as a result of some of the things you've written about his family. Yeah. yeah. So I want to ask you about local reception of your work. <laughs> Well, now, first of all, the, the, the saga of Coal Ridge, I have never had a single word of criticism uh, issued by any of the black people covered in that book. They, they appreciate it so much, simply being included in a book like that. And so many people ask me across the years, when I'd go talk to them, they'd say, you mean you're a college professor and you want to talk to me? And I'd say, yes, I need to, because I, that, without your information, I could not do what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do. So now, what else did you ask me? Well, about how, how people have received your work. And, uh, you know, both, you were talking about killings and getting into yeah. things that are very sensitive. Um, I think the story I told, what I remember you saying was that somebody, like a sheriff or a chief of police, was, was unhappy, a white person, that is, unhappy about what you said about his family's involvement with the black community. Oh yes. That was, uh, well, he, he was, he was uh, an, uh, an FBI, uh, a person who, who went around, well I, I, maybe in some other position rather than FBI, but anyway he went around and made all the arrests he could. On, uh, against people, you know, especially those who made moonshine whiskey. And, uh, oh, Big Big Six Henderson, that was his name, Big Six Henderson. But uh, the, th the thing about Big Six was, and he, he, and he, was a, he, he did not bother the, the black people, by the way, because he, he, he liked them and they liked him. And uh, although they were moonshine whiskey makers, I mean, virtually every one of them were, you know, the families but they had to do something to make a little money. And so he didn't, he didn't bother them. But the thing about Big Six was, he thought he was a woman's man. And he invited me once to meet him over at Burksville, Kentucky. And uh, we, we spent the night together in a room up on Alpine Hill. Which you, look, you look down, way down there, and there's Burksville <laughs> down below. And by golly, he called three women uh, from there in the room. And then it wasn't long until five women showed up. <laughs> now nothing took place now, don't get me wrong. <laughs> they just wanted you to sign books, right? <laughs> <laughs> but Big Six, I mean, the, the, the women, they did like Big Six Henderson. There's no question about it. <laughs> Well, how did, uh, you know, uh, you're talking about the community members had responding to it, but how would, you know, a lot of these things were sensitive topics. How were people, when you would, in the interview, you know, turn on the recorder and start to get into some of these sensitive topics? Were, were well, what I, what I typically did, uh, I, did, I never went to a house 
without letting them know that I would that I would be there. And uh, so uh, when I would go, I would have my tape recorder uh, with me, and then we'd go sit down, and we would uh, maybe talk for 10 or 15 minutes just in general, uh, you know, just uh, just chatting. And then I would say, well, what I need to do now is, is to turn to this, uh, I, need to, I need to record some things that I need to hear from you. And would you be willing for me to turn this tape recorder on? And uh, they all typically would say yes. And then uh, I guess eight or 10 of them said this to me, you mean you're a college professor and you want to record my stories? And I said, absolutely, because we're not for stories like what you're going to tell me. And I could not write the books that I do. And they went right ahead then, to my golly, and, and told me everything. So I, I was never totally rejected by anyone uh, that, that I can think of right now. And, and what happened was, not only did I contact them before going, but somebody that I had already interviewed would actually call them and tell them to be sure now when he comes over, be sure, you know, and sit down and, and, and talk with him. And there was one woman, and she's been gone now many years, and she was in her 80s then, but she would, would call me and she'd say, Linwood, come on over. I've got us some uh, interviews set up. And so I would go over and finally, well, she simply would, you know, would, I would drive my car and take her with me, but she always had a, a box lunch packed for us to eat on, on there, you know, there and back and what have you. But finally, believe it or not, that lady bought a tape recorder for herself, and when she had called me to come over and I'd go over and pick her up, she would take her tape recorder and we'd go sit down wherever we were going to. and. She would say, now Linwood, now just wait a minute. And she would turn her tape recorder on and, and ask questions for about 10 minutes. And then she'd say, well, now, that's all I need to ask. Now, Linwood, you go ahead and turn your tape recorder on now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and she, I've got to tell another story about her. She never knew, her mother and dad were never married. And she never knew who her dad was, period. <laughs> and uh, and I didn't know this at first. And when we'd be we'd go driving someplace, and I'd say, "Now, Ona, you've told me all about your dad, your mom, and about your grandparents because I know you grew up in their house. But now, tell me, who was your dad? And tell me about him." Oh, oh, Linwood! Did you see how fast that car was going that passed us there? <laughs> and then. In a few minutes, I'd say, now, Ona, now, go ahead now and tell me uh, who was your dad and where did he grow up? Oh, Linwood, there was another car. Oh, oh, that bolt of lightning there. She would never tell me who her dad was. And so finally, I, I went to the census of 1900, not looking for this, but I happened to run across her, her granddad and grandmother's name in the census. And there was her mother's name, and it told you know, uh, uh, about the date each one was born, and uh, what their job was, like a farmer and a housewife and all of that. And then there was little uh, uh, Ona's name, and she was then, uh, I think, eight years old. And it, it had her relationship to the head of the household. She was a boarder, B-O-A-R-D-E-R. They would not admit that she was illegitimate. They, so they simply pretended like on the federal census rule that she was a boarder living there in their house. So you get so many stories similar to that that it's, it's just wonderful, it really is, because you do learn all about local life and local people. I was in the house once, uh, either in Barron County or Monroe County, I think I was doing some field recording, and I remember noticing that there were three books in that house, so far as I could tell. One was a Bible, you know, of course, and, and one was a phone book, and one was your Monroe County history. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and that's when I realized in a little bit of field work I did, it always helped to say, I know Linwood Montel. <laughs> <laughs> that that you, you had been around so much and you worked so valued by so many people. So 
but I used, I guess at some point you were teaching at Campbellsville College and then you moved to Western. Yes. Can you talk about those years and that transition? Well, I, I taught at Campbellsville uh, after I got, I got finished at IU with my doctor's degree. I taught at Campbellsville for six years, 63 to 69. And I was even the academic dean for three for the last three years there. But an elderly professor of English at Western called me and he says, Dr. Montiel, I'm just wondering if you would be willing to come down to Western Kentucky State College and teach for us here. And so, by golly, I said, yes, I'll do it because I, I wanted to sort of change around anyway. And, uh, but anyway, that's, that's how I got to Western. Was that Gordon Wilson who called? Uh, was uh, Gordon Wilson still? As a matter of fact, it, it, it was Gordon Wilson. And he, he's, the, he's a very famous person, and there's a hall even uh, named at Western, the Gordon Wilson Hall. And he'd done a lot of scholarship on dialect and uh, yes, things yes, about local yes. culture. And, 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 and he, he wrote newspaper articles and things of that sort. And I'll never forget, uh, after I got there, and I was walking along the sidewalk there at, uh, on the uh, campus, and here comes Gordon Wilson. And of course, we had already met. But he looked at me and he smiled and he says, Linwood, you can't imagine how thankful I am that you agreed to come to Western Kentucky State College. It is now, of course, a university, but then it was a college. And was DK still there the or DK, had he moved? The DK, uh, the Wilgus was there for, uh, I don't know, he left in the early 60s and moved to, and started teaching at UCLA. And then, was there until I guess the, up in the 70s maybe, but he invited me, uh, that is UCLA invited me to come out and, and teach there one semester at UCLA. And I did, and I think it's 1972 when gas was 29.9 cents a gallon. So what was the transition from teaching at Western to really, you know, creating the department and, and really well, it's just simply that uh, every folklore course that uh, I taught at Western, and of course the, the doctor and Mrs. Clark also taught them as well at Western too at that time, but every folklore course that I taught and, and that they taught, I mean, they, they were totally loaded down with students. And so finally, I, I asked uh, the English professor, you know, would it be okay with you if we formed a separate department? And he said, well, I think what you need to do, because he didn't accept us in, in the English department. Who were some of the uh, faculty members that uh, were in the, the, the early? Well, uh, 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 Dr. Uh, I can't think of his first name now, Dr. Clark. And Ken, then, uh, Kenneth. Ken, Kenneth yeah. Clark and his wife, Mary Clark. They were both uh, they were PhDs. And of course, that the PhD stands for post hole digger. You knew that, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and uh, Cam Collins, Dr. Camilla Collins, mm -hmm. this, she she also uh, helped to form. Well, actually, she and I were the two. I, I think the Clarks had already moved to UCLA. When, uh, well, I know they had. They, they, this is in the 70s. Well, Ken, Ken was still teaching when I came in 75. Oh, was he? Yeah, Mary had retired. Okay, I, I guess simply the Cam Collins and I, we are the ones that do just totally motivated the, you know, the consideration of forming a master's program. And at that time, it came to be very, very, uh, even internationally known. And Texas offered, a, of course, a PhD in, uh, in folklore, I don't know what it was called exactly, and Penn, and uh, UCLA, and uh, uh, of course, Indiana, and then Ohio State uh, then, I think that came later, later. And then also, uh, there was uh, a, a Newfoundland, or, or Newfoundland, never how you want to call it. Uh, but uh, they, they founded a program up there, too. And so, but you know, most of those that offered a doctor's degree in, in folk studies or folklore and folk life 
have now closed down. So what are the ones that are still going? Indiana? Newfoundland. Newfoundland. Texas is through anthropology or English. Okay. But it, it is a wonderful field of, of study, as all of you know in, you're here today because of that. But uh, it, it is a field of study that incorporates several disciplines. I mean, like the social and cultural history, cultural geography, folklore, anthropology, English, and it just goes on and on because you teach a course in the introduction to folk studies, and it, it brings all of these into focus. So, so when you and Cam Collins were imagining this master's program, was was the program, of course, grew with an emphasis on the public sector. Yes. Um, was that something you th were thinking about at the very beginning, or is that something that, that happened as it matured? It just something something that happened as it matured. It just it grew better and better, and so we just decided how best, you know, to keep promoting it and by spreading out. Talk about hiring uh, Bert Feintuck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he actually has no memory of that. <laughs> uh, Bert who? <laughs> no, I, I must confess. I, now, I don't recall exactly why we hired him, but, <laughs> but I, I just do, showed up. But I do know that uh, that, that, that his, uh, well, he, he impressed us very much with, with his resume. And, and the more we, we studied that and the more we talked to him, the more we liked the fact and uh, that we did want him to become a, a faculty member at Western. And by gosh, I hate to say this, but I'm glad he came. <laughs> <laughs> what, what were some of the classes that were being taught in those early days of the department, and what were you continuing to teach? Well, uh, one of the things that I taught was cultural diversity, and uh, another one was simply supernatural folklore, and just different, 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 different things. <clears throat> but let me tell you uh, something that I would always do each time I taught a cultural diversity class. And I always had anywhere from three or four to nine or ten of the black students in that class. And I would say to the whole class at, at one, uh, one time in, 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 you know, during the semester, I would say, now how many fingers do you have on your right hand? Okay, now how many ears do you have? Okay, where is your nose? How many toes do you have on your left foot? What color blood do you have? And of course, all the answers, regardless of black or white, I mean, all the answers were the same, you see. And I said, I said there may be a little a difference in, in skin coloration, but we're all the same. We're all God's people. And on one occasion, five female black students stood up and gave me a standing ovation when I said that, that we're all God's people. And we are. I don't know that man back there. It's because I have my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to ask you this. Okay. Do you believe in ghosts? As I tell people who do uh, ask me that, I, I say I neither believe nor disbelieve. I simply record them as stories told by local people. But I have had two things that happen to me that I cannot explain away the natural means. Now, if you want to hear one of them, I'll tell you. But of course we do. Of course we do. <laughs> well, this one, uh, I spoke at uh, Nichols State University. Where is it located? Thibodeau, Louisiana, and that was in 1989, and I went down there and I gave my presentation, and after my presentation was over, they gave me a, a reception in my behalf, and then the people who uh, were going to, after it was all over, the, the, uh, the couple that owned the Melrose Plantation, and, and it had a, a very handsome old historic building on it, of a mansion. And they says, now we own the Melrose Plantation, and we keep, we'll keep you there tonight, 
as our overnight guest. And now we don't live here, we live other places, but we'll take you there and we'll pick you up for breakfast in the morning at seven o'clock. When we got out there, they, they took me to the Melrose Plantation house, gave me a key, and the, the husband said, now, this will get you in the, the, the downstairs room here from the outside into the room, uh, into the hallway, then go up the steps, the first door to your left, that will be your room for the night. And so, by golly, I took the key and I opened that door, pushed it back, and the moment I did that, you can see why I don't have any hair. <laughs> you can see why it's great. <laughs> Because the really and truly, this this truly happened. The hair on my head felt like it was standing straight out, and I had chill bumps all over my body, as big as goose eggs. It felt like, and whatever it was, I, I in there, I heard footsteps walking softly across the room, and then I could hear breathing. Now this is a true story. Now, I could hear breathing as it walked along. And finally, it got the smelling, sort of the, 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 an odor at least. And it was there doing all of these things. And I never saw it, of course, that didn't speak to me. But it was doing these things for a half hour, and then finally, just like that, it was gone. And I went to bed, and I finally got a little sleep. And the next morning, the couple came to get me to take me to breakfast. And I said, I want to know what in the world happened to me in that room up there last night. And the lady said, well, you tell us what, what happened to you. And so I explained what had taken place. And she said, well, the same thing that happened to you last night happens to over one half of our overnight guests in that room. And believe it or not, the lady and her husband who owned the Melrose Plantation she died back in the late 1880s. And apparently she loved this place so much that even after she died, she did not want to leave it, so she is still here. And so that is a true ghost story as far as I'm concerned. Thank you so much, not just so much. <laughs> well, you know, you've written so much about ghosts um, in this part of the world that you've chosen to study. Why, why, why so much about ghosts? Because people love to tell ghost stories and they love to read ghost stories. And the reason I love them so much, and I truly do, is because a ghost story has so much historical information in it that you can't find anywhere in a formal record. For example, here's an old haunted house, you know, and the story starts off by describing what the house looked like, where it was located, how many rooms it had in it, and who slept in what room, maybe, and even it might describe the weird personality of Uncle John or Aunt Jane. And then suddenly, here comes a ghost. But it, it tells you so much about that house that you could not find anywhere in a formal record. And I just love to record stories like that because it is so fabulous what, how much history you preserve, even though many people would say that's nonsense, but it is not nonsense. And the people who tell those ghost stories, most of them firmly believe that what happened, that they, they firmly believe that what they tell you did indeed happen, either to them or to maybe a, a parent or a community member. So whatever you do, as I tell my people when I, when I tell my, do my presentations, whatever you do, don't you laugh at a person who tells you a ghost story because as far as they're concerned, it's a very serious concern. So you talked about as a child hearing ghost stories. Um, and I'm curious as to, and then you've, as a, as a scholar, you've gone around and, and documented hundreds of ghost stories. Have you heard in, 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 in your research field work, have you heard the same, some of the same ghost stories come back around? Well, yes, uh, and, but the main ones that, that do come back around are the, what we call universal stories. 
about the you know the, the two men <coughs> that were that were standing by a cemetery <coughs> dividing up walnuts. Have you heard this story? And one of them will say, "You take this one, and I'll take that one. You take this one, and I'll take that one." And they were dividing up the walnuts there. And here comes an elderly man walking down through there, and he hears them say, you take this one and I'll take that one. And he thought it was God and the devil dividing up the dead, <laughs> pulling up out of the grave, you know. And then suddenly, maybe here comes one of them out of the grave that reaches out and says, I got you. Just stuff like that, but, uh, but th those are universal stories. But uh, it, it's very seldom, very seldom, that you ever have a story told to you that is told to be a true story that actually uh, is, is related by someone else that knows nothing about the story itself. You've also written about lawyers' stories and doctors' stories, which in some ways to me are more frightening than ghost stories, I think, <laughs> as a subject. So, uh, talk something about what brought you to these, these different occupations. Well, uh, simply I decided that what I needed to do was uh, to use an uh, oral history methodology to go around the state of Kentucky to uh, interview these lawyers and doctors. And I did the same thing in Tennessee at least, but I, I just thought this would be a good way to preserve their legacy. And uh, so I, I travel across, the, I, I covered every sub-regional area, not every city or town, but simply I covered every sub-regional area as I did these uh, books. And these are authentic stories told by the lawyers and the doctors. And <coughs> on the back of the, I've got to tell a couple of stories. Good. On the back of the uh, Tales from Kentucky Lawyers, the press chose to put this back there. It's on the back of the book now. And it says that this lady was standing, uh, that is, this lady was uh, in court one day, and the, the, the judge asked her, now, lady, is it true that you had sex with a hippie on top of a motorcycle in a peach orchard on June the 23rd? And she thought for a couple of minutes and said, what was that date again? <laughs> <laughs> now, I doubt that's a true story. That's most likely a universal story. But and here's one that, that I like. It's in the doctor's story book. And this is told to be a true story, and I believe it. This doctor told me, he said, this elderly man came in one Saturday morning to see me in my office. And this elderly man's wife was with him. And when I called him back into my office to take care of his needs, his wife stayed out there in the waiting room. And about 25 minutes later, when I got finished with the, this man taking care of him, I walked back out into the waiting room with him. And in a joking way, I simply said, oh, by the way, Bill, how's your Viagra doing these days? And his wife hopped up and said, if he's taking Viagra, he's not using it at home. <laughs> but th there, are, th there are from 12 to 20 categories of stories in those books, anywhere from, from sad to serious to humorous. But I love to share the humorous stories. <laughs> and uh, I even uh, gave a presentation here in Louisville about two weeks ago to, uh, no, 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 it was in Lexington, to the Lexington Medical Society, and it was uh, about my, the stories from Kentucky doctors. And by golly, there were over 100 there in the audience because they just wanted to hear what, my, what the book was like. And so it, it's for sale here today now, and so is the lawyer story book and my ghost story books, and if you don't buy at least five, five books, <laughs> then I'll come back as a ghost and get all of them. <laughs> I have a question. Um, so back to the classroom, you know, back to your, your, your office as a professor, um, and, and you're advising a student today, uh, uh, a student in, in folk studies, and they want to study the Upper Cumberland region. What would you actually advise them to do? What, what, how has that region changed and what 
what, what do you, uh, how would you advise a student to sort of take the same approach that you took? Well, uh, I would simply advise them to do what I do, and that is to simply drive across even the back roads and, and to look at what is there right now, and then maybe six months later, to drive the same area looking for changes that have taken place for, for new buildings that have been you know constructed even residential houses or even maybe store buildings and the, and the little communities and things of that sort and uh, and or I simply am, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm always interested in music and, and things like that so I will simply say that if there is a person in your community you know, who uh, knows all about old-time music or even contemporary, then go to them and, and sit down and talk to them because you need to record their memories while they're still here and can tell you why they became interested in doing whatever it is they're doing. And so that, that's, that's very important that, uh, that every sub-regional area in your home state, wherever it is, you need to work on that because if you don't do it, so many of your people will, will lose their heritage when they're gone. That is, their, their descendants will lose their heritage when their ancestor is gone. If I, I want to follow up on that a little bit. These days, a lot of commentators say that place doesn't matter very much. You know, they say it's all Walmarts and McDonald's and so forth. And Lomax wrote about the cultural gray out and, and so forth. But I mean, you're one of the great American scholars of the place. And the, Way you've devoted yourself to one part of the world and produced so much about it. How, how do you answer people who, who say place is just not significant the way it once was? Well, uh, I don't know how I would, re re would respond to that except to simply say, well, I ask them, where did you grow up? And now, if you were to die tonight, assuming you'll be buried rather than cremated, where will you be buried? And most of them will say, my golly, you know, I've not really thought about that yet. And so, but, but a lot of people will say to me, don't you fret, I'm going home home whenever I die because I want to be buried where my people are buried. And so uh, we, we just need, we need to do something to remind them of their home place and that the home is home. There, there's, there's no place like, even in your memories, there's no place like home. And I love the songs that are written that portray that type of thing. I, I might not have answered your question. No, no, you did. You did. Well, we were going to make sure that the, the, the tail end of this uh, is, is really an attempt to, uh, to open up the floor, I think, and, 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 and let you all uh, ask some questions. But first, I'm going to ask one. One more. One more. Okay. I've been thinking about this. It's 19 books, is it? Uh, 22 that I've written all total, and I've got two more at press right now, and I'm still working <laughs> on, on, the, on another one. And before I answer your question, uh, well, maybe I have already. No, no. <laughs> but in a way, and I don't think I told you this, but I'm working on a, a new book now of the tales told by former one-room school teachers. I told you that, didn't I? And it's, it's amazing the types of things that they can share with you of what life was like back when they were teaching and how they had to walk to school, maybe even as a teacher, because the roads were muddy and things like that. And uh, when the kids would get there, they would have dirty, dirty feet, you know, and they would come in and get the, the, the school floor all dirtied up and, and they'd have to spend some hours getting the, the floor cleaned up and th just things like that. It's, it's just a, a truly amazing to hear what they have to tell you. So my question is, with that remarkable amount of production, uh, talk about your discipline. Talk about how you've gotten these things researched and written over the course of your life. Well, I don't know how to answer that question. I, I just know that I did it because I was interested. I just felt like that every topic that I have pursued needed to be uh, to be written about and in order to do this you've got to talk with the local people and so uh, I've been told many times for example now that I need to they say since you've got that book of tales from Kentucky doctors you need to have one of tales from Kentucky nurses and then also <laughs> people have said uh, how about law enforcement officials 
Now, wouldn't they have some good stories to tell? So, I mean, the list just goes on and on, and as long as I'm allowed to live, I never intend to stop working on a, a different project, and I just totally intend to keep on. And even though I am going to make it to age 130. <laughs> so now, questions? Yes, I see all those hands. <laughs> <laughs> When you were talking about the, the sense of place and how that's associated with home, do you think that it's more prevalent in the South, in this in this geographic region, than other areas of the United States? Or well, I don't know that I can uh, accurately answer that. I just know that it is totally, totally uh, important and significant to the people here in the South and in the Upper South. And the, the people that I have run into who are from other parts of the country, of the, of the count of the <coughs> United States, that indeed they do appreciate their home place just as much as, as where I grew up. So I think it's, it's the challenge is that everybody just needs to write about where you, where you grew up, even if you don't focus on yourself. Yes? Yeah, I just uh, wondered, you talked about a connection up to uh, IU and so forth, but I wonder about the Lexington connection. Um, did you know William Jansen, for example? Over at, uh, yes, yes, yes. University of Kentucky? Yes, oh, absolutely. Could you tell me a little bit, of, tell us a little bit about that connection? Well, actually, no, I, I can't. Okay. I, I just, I just, I, I met him and, I, and, 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 and yeah. dealt with him, but I don't have any stories to share about it. But the University Press of Kentucky, they're, they're, it's just a wonderful staff they have there, but I'll say the same thing for, and, and by the way, four different university presses have published my books. And that's Indiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Kentucky. And let me tell you about one little thing that you need to, how many of you have grandkids? Just you? Okay, how many of you have kids? Okay, now, my, my wife has got a granddaughter. She's my step-granddaughter, and I've got to share this with you. <clears throat> when she, she's eight years old now, and she was seven years old last year, but what she decided to do was to write a ghost story. And so she did, at age seven now, she wrote a ghost story, and it ended by, well, it's simply about how, how these monsters scared her to death, first of all, scared her to death, and, and she fainted because she thought she had had a heart attack. That's part of the story, you know. <laughs> and her mother came running out, oh, what's happened to my baby daughter? You know, what's happened? And, and her, her, she said, and Mama grabbed a shovel and started running all everything away from me. And said, Mama, then she saw this ghost. And she went running over there to this ghost, and she reached her arms out and went, boo! And that scared that ghost to death, and he went running away. <laughs> a little seven-year-old girl wrote that story down. And so what we need, you need to do is to encourage the youngsters to start being creative that way you truly do. And you oldsters, <laughs> you need to start being creative too. Uh, even I know you are already, but just keep doing it. Because as folklorists, by golly, we do do a good job and we need to keep going as long as we live. And so just don't ever stop doing something worthwhile and that's beneficial to humanity overall. Yes. Hi, Alan. I mean, Jalen Uh Well, I wanted to ask you to throw you out a little more. I'm in the process right now of visiting people about whom I've written for a book I'm publishing, which is a declaration that you know I'm interested in that. And, and I've been struck again and again where I was anxious that they might find it embarrassing, that they judged it not on whether it was embarrassing or not, but whether it was true or not. And it's, it's been kind of a revelation to me to have this happen over and over again, that 
the, the focus in every case was not, oh, I don't want to say, say that because it would yeah. be embarrassing <clears throat> to so and so. They would listen to it and they say, well, that's right, that's true. You know? And it was really striking and, to me. And, and that happened in my doctor's story interviews and also uh, even uh, with, uh, well, the lawyers. But, uh, and, and with the funeral directors, which is now at Chris, but uh, when, when they would tell me a story and they'll say, uh oh, maybe you shouldn't use that one because it's got so and so's name in it. And I'll say, well, now let's simply uh, leave that person's name out and let's just simply say this elderly gentleman. And rather than, 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 than uh, calling a name or telling where they're from or anything, you know, and just. That's not changing as far as the outside readers are concerned. It just doesn't matter that much, you know, as to who the person really was. Although it does matter to the local people. But by golly, you just might get shot and killed if you do it, or you might get sued. And so you do have to be careful. <coughs> so I, I do change some of the names after I'm asked to do it, yes. Well, I mean, I change all of them if they ask me to do it. Because I, 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 I try to avoid anything that is simply uh, that might be a legal issue, even if I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Especially <laughs> since you're not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Are we finished? I think we're finished. Really. Thank you so much.